Hey everyone! Today we'll be discussing a case that remained a mystery for 33 years and was recently solved. This is the case of Carrie Ann Jo Peck. Carrie Ann Jo Peck was born to her parents Carolyn Robert on the 17th of August 1968 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. They also had a sister named Maggie. Unfortunately, Carrie Ann's parents split when she was very young and her mother remarried. Carolyn's second husband's name was Frederick Tuxonia, but he was more commonly referred to as Fred. Carrie, her mother, sister and Fred all lived in Kulahai, which is in the centre of Milwaukee. Carrie was brought up in a loving family environment and it's evident by the way her family speaks about her in interviews how much she was loved. She was described as kind, loving, considerate of others and all over had the best type of energy that would attract anyone to want to be friends with her. Despite the description her family gives her, when Carrie was a teenager, her and Fred did bump heads quite a bit. Carrie would often say things like, you're not my dad, to Fred, if he tried to show any authority over her. Of course, this wasn't easy for Fred to hear, but her mom believes that this was just due to Carrie's combative attitude and was mainly down to her just being a teenager at the time. What teenager doesn't say things they don't mean in the heat of an argument? Carrie's family also describe her as willful, so in other words, she was headstrong, and liked to have her own way around the house. And when that didn't happen, Carrie's combative teenage side would show a little more. So in 1982, Carrie turned 13 years old, officially making her a teenager. And she was starting to express her interest in having sleepovers with friends. On the 15th of March that year, Carrie and her friend Maggie decided to have a sleepover together. And when morning came, the girls got up, got ready for school and walked to school together. Carrie and Maggie were both attending Kazuku Middle School in Katahai and were both in the seventh grade. This school day was like any other. They split up once they arrived at school and went to their designated classes. Once lunchtime came around, Maggie recalls seeing Carrie but described her as being agitated as allegedly a boy had spilled paint on Carrie's shirt and in retaliation Carrie had hit him and was suspended from school. Maggie also recalls Carrie being worried about returning home and explaining the situation and suspension to her parents, as she knew her parents, particularly Fred, were not going to be pleased with her, and she feared what Fred was going to say. Upon doing further research, there were other reports that suggested Carrie's suspension was due to the fact that she had been caught walking the halls during class time and was suspended on behalf of skipping classes, but this is only alleged and not confirmed. Regardless, Carrie's mother was informed by the school of the suspension and they gave her the option of either collecting Carrie or allowing her to walk home. And Carolyn, Carrie's mother, decided on letting her daughter walk home from school as the school was super close to their house. Not only that, but it was the 80s and the community had a reputation of being safe because everyone knew everyone. So I'm pretty sure it never crossed Carolyn's mind on letting her daughter walk home from school literally a mere three minutes away. So Carrie is released from school at lunchtime on this particular day to begin her suspension. Her mother Carolyn is sitting at home awaiting Carrie's arrival, but after a bit of time, Carolyn noticed it was taking Carrie a little longer than it should for her to walk home from the school. Because keep in mind, the school was only a very short walk away. However, her mother did like to give Carrie some independence and figured that maybe she dropped in to see a friend on the way home from school. To me, this kind of seemed off because Kai was literally 13, so any potential friend she may have had or may have went to meet up with, surely they would have been in school at the time. The only reason Kai was let out of school is because she was being suspended. But again, this is the 80s, so I'm sure her mother didn't ever expect any harm to come to her daughter. However, at this point, it was starting to get dark and it had been several hours since Kai was released from school and was expected home. So, this starts to worry her mother. Again, because this was the 80s, it wasn't like Carolyn could pick up a phone and contact her daughter to ensure her safety. All phones were landlines back then, and even that wasn't common. So naturally, Carolyn begins to worry. Carolyn leaves the house and walks across the street to Carrie's best friend, a girl named Robin Mann. She asks Robin if Carrie is there, or if Robin has seen or heard from Carrie, and Robin said she hadn't seen her since Carrie left school that day. Carolyn then decides to call Maggie's family and ask them if they have happened to hear from her either.
Carolyn suspected that because Carrie slept over in Maggie's the night before, she may have returned to their house to avoid potential trouble that she was going to get into from her parents due to the suspension. However, Maggie's family say that she's not at their house and Maggie actually hasn't seen her since she was suspended at lunchtime either, just like Robin. So at this point, Carolyn begins to worry even more and decides to contact everyone she can think of in the neighborhood, in their family and in Carrie's group of friends and none of them had seen or heard from her. So by 11 p.m. that night, Carolyn had conducted a search party consisting of most, if not all, her friends and family. They searched the local areas and nearby streets, but unfortunately they found nothing. The following day, on the 17th of March, 1982, Carolyn filed a missing persons police report. The investigation was immediately opened with the police holding interviews with friends, families, neighbours and even teachers in Carrie's school were being questioned on whether they had seen or heard from Carrie since she left school the previous day and again they were unsuccessful in finding any clues. Because there was literally no leads following Carrie leaving school that day, police initially ruled Carrie's missing persons report as a teen runaway. Carolyn often phoned police for updates and never received any. She was reported saying, quote, I called the police department and they said, well, there are so many runaways that we can't really look for just one. I knew she didn't run away, but that's what they said to me. They just didn't care, end quote. So anyone who watches true crime knows that the first 24 hours of a missing persons case are the most critical, especially if that missing person is a minor. The more time that goes by that the person isn't seen or at the very least heard from, the less likely it is that that person is to be found alive. But considering it hadn't even been 24 hours since Carrie went missing, everyone was trying to remain optimistic and even looked into the idea that Carrie may have gone to her father Robert's to stay for a while, as he still lived nearby. But alas, he had not heard from or seen Carrie and had actually been at work all day the day she'd left school and all day the following day, so they neglected that theory. Although police were still convinced that they had a runaway case in their hands, they were still preparing for the worst outcome as this was still a 13-year-old girl that no one had seen or heard from or had any idea on her whereabouts following her leaving school that day. Suspect number one. Despite still looking at this case as a teen runaway case, there were a few members of law enforcement that decided to undergo interviews of potential suspects in case this case turned a little more sinister than they anticipated. The first suspect that they interviewed was actually the brother of someone I mentioned earlier on in the case, Carrie's best friend, Robin Mann's brother, John Mann. John Mann was 17 years old at the time and was described by police as a derelict. He had a little bit of a history of police, mainly just petty crimes of small theft, taking and distributing drugs and causing a little bit of commotion in his local area. On top of those reasonings for police to suspect him, another reason was that apparently he had made romantic gestures towards Carrie. So he was taken in for questioning. However, he denied having any involvement. He denied knowing her whereabouts and denied having seen or spoken to her for the past while. And because police had no evidence to suggest otherwise, they had to release him. Suspect 2 The second suspect was investigated due to a tip-off that was given into police and it was actually surrounding Carrie's stepfather Fred. The tip that someone had anonymously given into police was that they were concerned that Fred may be involved in Carrie's disappearance as Fred had recently laid a slab of concrete in the backyard for his patio and they were worried that it may have also been used to bury the body of Carrie. However, police took it upon themselves to go out to this concrete slab and use ground penetrating radars to dig it up, but again, they found nothing. As hurdles I'm sure Fred was to even be considered a suspect in this case, it's good to know that whoever gave that tip in was looking out for Carrie's best interest in being found and was just trying to uncover any kind of evidence that they could in order to potentially find Carrie and they weren't willing to leave any stone unturned. However, this tip led them nowhere. As the only two suspects that police were initially concerned about were cleared and there was literally no evidence in this case whatsoever, police tried initiative thinking and came up with a theory that Carrie could potentially have had a secret boyfriend that she told no one about, decided to meet up with him following her termination of school that day 
and run away with him. But again, due to lack of evidence, this theory was dismissed. So this brought police right back to square one. There was no longer any suspects, no suspicious activity to investigate, no potential motives, no further leads, no CCTV cameras or phones or texts for call records, because again, this was the 80s, no clothing items or no personal belongings of Carrie's found, and nobody, nothing. Police were back at the beginning, considering this to be a teen runaway. After some time had passed with no leads in the case, Carrie Somney decided to hold a public appeal, willing anyone who had any information whatsoever to come forward. This appeal garnered the attention of a few people who had called with reportings of seeing Carrie. Even Carolyn had thought she might have seen Carrie. But unfortunately, none of these reportings could be confirmed to have been Carrie. So naturally, hope faded as people grew frustrated and ultimately the case went cold. It wouldn't be until a year later on September 2nd of 1983 that new developments in this case would finally be made. A contractor was called out to the Mann family home where Carrie's best friend Robin and her brother John, who were both mentioned previously in this case, lived with their family. The contractor was hired to take down the back porch and level out the soil, which is what he began doing. Halfway through this, he started to notice a weird odor coming from the soil, but he didn't think much of it, just continued doing his job, until eventually he struck something. He kept tipping away at the surface of what he struck, and eventually he found what he knew to be human remains. Immediately, emergency services were contacted and they rushed to the scene. Naturally, everyone was in disbelief, but it was too early to be determined who the remains belonged to. However, crowds gathered to the house and everyone was talking about how devastated they felt. And they all came to the mutual speculation that these were the remains of Carrie Ann. Purely based on the fact that these remains were found at Carrie's best friend's house. Carrie's house was right across the street. And her brother John had already been a person of interest. And the fact that Carrie was still a missing person a year after her disappearance had been reported. It all just connected. Not only that, but everyone who had come to the house that evening also speculated that John was responsible for this due to everything I just mentioned. But also, apparently, when the remains are being extracted from the ground, John was said to have been seen vomiting. So, Carolyn was called in to identify these remains and she was able to confirm that these remains did, in fact, belong to her daughter Carrie through identifying a jacket that was buried with these remains that belonged to her daughter. There's nothing that can prepare a mother for identifying her daughter's body in any case, but because this case had no evidence from the get-go, no suspicion of any type of foul play or any evidence of malicious motives whatsoever, nothing that even alluded to the possibility of any harm of any kind that came to her daughter, so this was just sprung on her. I'm sure the lack of evidence clues or conclusions were extremely hard for Carrie's family. However, without them, it also meant they could hold on to hope that their daughter was still out there and alive. So I can't imagine how Carolyn must have felt identifying her daughter's remains that were literally right in front of her the entire time. Although they found the remains in the Mann family home, they still had more questions than answers. Obviously they can speculate and almost guarantee who was responsible for this situation but they can't yet confirm it. So Carrie's friends, family and neighbours are still left wondering why, when, how and who is responsible for this. All the while pretty much being able to guarantee with certainty who is accountable. After Carrie's remains were found in the Mann family back garden, the police obviously then had probable cause to bring John back in for questioning, now on suspicion of murder instead of just as a suspect. However, once again, John denied everything and even requested a lawyer before agreeing to cooperate any further. Which initially for me was a bit of a red flag because in a lot of cases that I've watched, usually, not always, but usually, if the person of interest refuses to speak without a lawyer present, it's typically because they have something to hide and they may feel that they might say something that could be held against them if they ever went to court. Otherwise, if you're innocent, surely you'd want to do everything you can to help. 
especially if you are innocent, but are being held suspect on account of a crime. But again, regardless of speculation, due to having no physical evidence that John was accountable for the murder of Carrie, the police had to release him. Following John's release from police custody, it took an additional couple of days for Carrie's autopsy to come in, but they detailed her probable cause of death as intracranial hemorrhaging as a result of lacerations to her left vertebral artery, a fracture to her C1 vertebrae. So, essentially, Carrie had passed away from internal bleeding due to her injuries through her neck and skull. So because of her injuries, it can be confirmed that her death was in fact a murder. However, the rest of the case is still a mystery. The only other definite that there is, is Carrie's last known whereabouts was at the man house. However, due to Robin, John's sister being Carrie's best friend, it was pretty normal that she'd be over there. The only question that remained was, who buried her there and why? So after Carrie's remains and probable cause of death were released to the public of the community, other details of that night started coming to light. Allegedly, the night that Carrie disappeared, John was said to have held a party in his family home whilst his mother was away and Robin was about to go. However, there's no physical evidence to support the fact that this party ever took place, apart from hearsay. So police never really considered it when investigating the case further, as they couldn't come to a mutual agreement on whether there was a party that happened on that evening. It's a bit of a tricky one because when the public found out about this, it looked like the police, they were torn on what to believe. Some people believed the party made total sense as to how this murder could have happened, and others thought there's no possible way that there was a party being held on the same night that a teenage girl went missing. Surely someone would have notified police about the party, following the news of Carrie's disappearance. Either way, John Mann has always denied this, which gives those who believe he's guilty even more reason to believe so, as now he has a massive reason to lie and denied ever holding a party, because if it's true, now he has no other alibi, which means he was at his home at the same time Carrie went missing and inevitably, when she was murdered. I also wanted to add in here that there's speculation that Carrie got herself suspended on purpose so that she could go to Robin's house and attend this party that she knew that the mans were having. This is purely speculation and has never been proven. Four days after Carrie's remains were found, another leap presented itself when a neighbour came forward to police detailing information on a young boy named Jose Ferreira who was 16 years old at the time. This neighbour told police that they had seen Jose near the hall where Carrie's remains were found, his hands in the air, and could be heard murmuring something along the lines of, I am so sorry, Carrie, whilst crying and screaming. Jose, who frequently went by Junior, lived two doors down from the man's and across the road from Carrie, so they all lived near each other. Following this lead, police, of course, took Jose in for questioning about that night and about Carrie's remains, and of course, Jose denies having any involvement with Carrie's death, and the reason he was spotted at Carrie's graveside, acting hysterically, was because he was good friends with Carrie while she was still alive, and he was devastated about the whole situation. Police also questioned him about the party, and he denied there ever being a party. So again, because police had no physical evidence to hold him on, they had to let him free. Despite Jose telling police that he was close with Carrie prior to her death, there is no evidence to prove this statement. However, following his release from police's custody, he did become really close to Carrie's family. He grieved Carrie's loss with her family, became a regular social gatherings, and would even have dinners with them regularly. Carrie's family described him as being a, quote, lovely young man, end quote. So again, time would pass, and this time years would go by with no new leads in the case, no evidence, and no progress whatsoever. Police were as close to solving this case now as they were when it first happened. Obviously, they had Carrie's remains, so they could confirm through her autopsy that there had been foul pay to some degree. But since there were no leads of possible suspects, the police couldn't do anything. But at least her family could have Carrie home with them. Once again, and get some form of closure of knowing their daughter's unfortunate fate, and could hold a funeral for her if they saw fit. But otherwise... There was no evidence to hold anyone accountable for Carrie's tragic passing. The Mann family would, over time, move out of the neighbourhood and Carrie's family were left in limbo to find out exactly what happened to their daughter on that night and who was responsible for it. 
However, this time the case truly went cold, and almost was closed. Until recently, in 2015, 33 years after Carrie initially disappeared, and the family would receive any kind of news. These answers came in the form of a phone call to a local news station. Around 7 a.m. on the 11th of October 2015, a journalist for the WISN 12 News received a call from a man who said, quote, I want to confess to a murder, end quote. And this man was none other than Jose Ferrer. On the same day, Jose also called a crisis hotline counsellor admitting to the murder and said he didn't know whether he wanted the glory for the murder or whether he should stay silent to pay his involvement. But either way, he knew he wanted the case to be reopened and for the murder to be on the news. He made his third call to his estranged wife, who was in the process of divorcing him, and once again confessed to the murder of 13-year-old Carrie Ann Jopek. Of course, all three people Jose contacted notified police. The journalist and crisis counsellor both called police by a phone, but Jose's estranged wife took it upon herself to go into the West Milwaukee police station to tell them what her soon-to-be ex-husband had just confessed to. So now, police are questioning the legitimacy of Jose's confession. After all, Jose is now in his 50s. It had been 33 years that Carrie's case had been called. Police are confused why suddenly 33 years later, Jose had randomly decided to confess especially after being questioned all those years prior and getting away with it. They're confused as to why he confessed to a murder of one of his family members or the family he had purportedly gotten close to, that he grieved with and had dinners with and showed up to Carrie's family events with. But alas, police were now facing going back in time and looking back on the case now 33 years called. The investigation details on record and compare them to Jose's statement, and two days later, after Jose's confession, on the 13th of October, police bring him back in for questioning, exactly like they did 33 years prior. Jose confesses to telling a local journalist about the murder, telling his estranged, soon-to-be ex-wife about the murder, a crisis hotline about the murder, and now he finally admits it to police. So he was subsequently charged with second-degree murder. Now, literally, I couldn't really find any information on why he wasn't charged with first-degree murder, but in my own personal opinion, it's most likely because the murder wasn't premeditated and perhaps may have been in the spur of the moment or done by accident. Um, obviously, as we go further into the case, we will divulge as to what really happened. So, what Jose alleged happened on the night of Carrie's murder 33 years prior on the 16th of March 1982 is that Carrie was walking home from school following her suspension from school that same day when she came across this big party being held in the man household. The big party that I referred to earlier on in the story that could never be confirmed by anyone who was brought in for questioning by police at the time has finally been confirmed 33 years later. No one can confirm, however, what it is that made Jose come forward all these years later. However, it is believed he did this to get his estranged wife to call off their looming divorce proceedings and have her not divorce him. Allegedly, he also told Carrie's mother, Carolyn, that Carrie's spirit had been haunting him since the night of the murder and that her spirit wouldn't leave him alone until he confessed, which was more than likely another contributing factor to his confession. However, many people, including the police, take this confession with a grain of salt as I feel as though he is trying to paint himself in a better light. Jose admits that Carrie joined them at the party on the night of her murder, and at one point of the night, she walks up to Jose and asks if he has any alcohol. At the, this point in time, Carrie is 13 and Jose is 16. He tells her he doesn't have any alcohol, but he does have a joint and offers her some of it. She allegedly took a small puff before coughing on it and not wanting any more to which Jose then decides he wants to take her to the basin and make out with her. Initially, Carrie agrees and makes her way to the basement stairs with Jose. But once they reach the top of the basement, Carrie changes her mind and no longer wants to go down to the basement with Jose. Jose gets angry about her sudden change of mind and pushes her down the stairs. Jose pushes her with so much force that her head hits the railing, her neck snaps back and she dies instantly. Jose then claims he ran downstairs thinking she was unconscious, not knowing she was dead at this point, 
And I do want to give a bit of a trigger warning here. These next few minutes might be hard for some viewers to hear, so skip ahead the next couple of seconds if this part is too hard for you to listen to. But I will be mentioning S.A. Jose then said he touched her breasts, and that's all he did. However, this kind of information is something that police advise to take with a grain of salt, because they don't actually know if that's all he did to her. It's disgusting to me to think the 16-year-old would not only commit such a disgusting crime of harming such a young girl with a forceful impact, but would then go down to her unconscious body, not to check if she was okay, but to start touching it without her consent it makes me want to puke. But at a certain point of him essaying her, he realizes that she's not breathing, so she's not just unconscious, and he begins to freak out. So according to Jose's confession 33 years later, he claims that this was an accident. However, if this did happen the way he explained it to have happened, it wasn't exactly an accident if it's a result of your initially shitty behavior. Furthermore, in Jose's confession, he admits to wanting to leave Carrie's body at the bottom of the stairs, but he then recalled that people at the party saw him with Carrie and would be able to pinpoint him as the last person to see Carrie alive, and so now he has to get rid of the body. Now, when I came across this part of his confession, it didn't make much sense to me because regardless of whether he left Carrie or got rid of her body, he would still be the last person to be seen with her. So surely when she turns up missing the next day, the people at the party would inevitably know who was responsible for her disappearance. However, either way, he decides he must get rid of the body. So after being neighbors with the mans for many years, Jose is quite familiar with the layout of their house. And so whilst this party is still going on, he drags Carrie's body from the bottom of the basement stairs to the back door, which he then begins digging a grave for Carrie where he would put her body whilst the party was going on upstairs. And the body would remain there for 33 years until Jose inevitably rats himself out. So obviously police asked him if anybody else was involved in helping him with this, anyone accompanied him, any alliances, and he said no. But it just remained a big question mark for me. And because there was no evidence to prove that anyone else was involved, police had to take his word for it. But having said that, there was no evidence that he was involved either. So naturally, this confession was really hard for Carrie's parents and family. But it was even harder knowing that it was coming from someone who had grown so close to their family, who they considered now to be a family friend. Like I previously mentioned, he would show up at their family events. He would have dinners with them regularly. He would grieve with them. And the sad thing is he would grieve with them knowing that he was responsible for the grief that they had and would still grieve with them. He would watch them cry over the loss of Carrie. He would watch them mourn and grieve and he would grieve along with them. And yet he never had enough remorse to tell them that he was responsible for their grief. So as I mentioned previously, Jose actually admitted to Carolyn, Carrie's mother, that he had been haunted by the ghost of Carrie. And People speculate that this was actually his way of confessing to Carolyn that he was responsible for Carrie's death without actually confessing. So, as I mentioned, Jose was facing a second degree murder charge. So, when it came to sentencing, he was carrying a sentence of 20 years. And because of this, his attorney was trying to convince him to plead not guilty on the basis that he technically wasn't responsible because the death was an accident. So at his initial first hearing, he pled not guilty and was held on a $200,000 bail. His hearing was then held at the end of that month and his attorney tried to deflect the blame off of him and on to John Mann. And he even went as far as to try and get Robin's ex-boyfriend involved, saying that John Mann had told Jose that he had confessed to the crime, which Robin 
confirms is not true. Following the end of the court hearing, despite Jose's confession, his district attorney offered him a plea deal, mainly due to the fact that there was such a lack of evidence and the fact that the confession came 33 years too late. So on March of 2017, two years after he initially made the confession about murdering Carrie, as part of his plea deal, he pled guilty to sexual assault and false imprisonment and was only sentenced to seven years in prison. And this sentence came 35 years and one day after Carrie's initial disappearance. After the sentencing was carried out, Jose apologized to Carrie's family. He said, quote, I can't take back how it happened. Sorry from the deepest pain in my heart. Sorry. End quote. Carrie's cousin said, quote, He got to be married, he got to have a family, and she got nothing. End quote. Carrie's mother, Carolyn, said, quote, It's been 33 years since she's been gone. I've been praying for this day. At least we got some closure. And he's going to be sitting there. End quote. Carol also reportedly said that she feels as though he never felt remorse. And I think everyone totally agrees with that. Like I said, he grieved with the family. He sat there whilst they cried. He cried with them. He attended family dinners with them and family events with them. Meanwhile knowing the whole time that he was responsible for their pain and still did nothing about it until 33 years later when the only reason he confessed was allegedly to get his estranged wife to not proceed with the divorce. More information also came out during Jose's sentencing from the medical examiner who did the autopsy report and they actually came out and said that it's more likely that Carrie died from being struck in the neck by something heavy rather than falling down the stairs. As of 2022, Jose has been released from prison and lives in Glendale, Wisconsin as a registered sex offender and is allegedly under strict supervision, but it still won't ever bring back the fact that he murdered a 13-year-old girl. But that's everything for today's case. Thanks so much for watching.